In that book, I had mentioned uh, staying a few days at Puttaparthi, and uh, someone who read this chapter then suggested, why don't you do a full-length Life of Sai Baba? What caused you to stop for a few days in Puttaparthi? Just another... Well, I'd been coming since the 70s. Okay, so you Part were... Partly because my companion on the inner path is a great devotee of Sai Baba, Ranima. Mm -hmm. Sai Baba is something else. He is divinity that you, I've never seen anything like it yeah. and it's buoyant it isn't this you know usual religious you know grim I mean these people from all the nations they're not concerned about you know I'm a Scotsman I'm better than you I'm a Brahmin I'm better than you no his Sai Baba is better than us all he is a prolific writer a great storyteller and a Scotsman transplanted to India Bill Aiken, the author of the important and serious book, Sri Satya Sai Baba, A Life. Welcome to Soul Turns. This interview was recorded in Sai Baba's ashram in January 2004. Very good to be talking with Bill Aiken. You don't pronounce the T in his name. Bill Aiken, who is the author of this wonderful book, Sri Satya Sai Baba, A Life. Bill, you're from Scotland, although you've probably lived maybe as I'm a, technically a naturalized Indian citizen now. Mm, okay, and you've lived here how many years? I came in 1959. And for most of those years, how would you describe what you've been doing? <laughs> Mucking about. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing more constructive than that? No. <laughs> well, then that leads me to my second and final question. Whatever led you to write this book, A Life, Sri Satya Sai Baba? Well, you want the whole story? Yes, I want the whole story. Then there goes your, your, your interview. <laughs> <laughs> I was cocking my leg over my motorbike in uh, 1986, and uh, I hadn't put the foot down, so technically the journey hadn't started. I was going to Spiti, a border area, to run in this, this new motorbike. On in Himachal border with Tibet. I hadn't put my foot down, the phone rang, so I thought I haven't started. It's inauspicious in India if you go back when you've started. So I, I hadn't started. I went to answer the phone, uh, an editor saying, I liked your articles on steam railways in the Statesman Delhi. Would you do us a book? I said, fine. So then I went off to Spiti, I came back, I, I did the book. The book moved well on railways, backgrounder, and with general travel. It, was this for the uh, travel audience, for, tra uh, for tourists and travelers? Or? No, this is, uh, funnily enough, it was Oxford University Press. Uh, I mean, it sounds very academic. And uh, anyway, after this, the, the, the passability of, of this first book, he said, will you do me another? sort of backgrounder and I said fine and he said what I, I said what about the Deccan mm -hmm. which is what you have here yeah. okay that's what really turns me on uh, you know I was born at the foot of the Ochil Hills in Scotland I've always you know responded to these terrific archetypal rock formations and yes. the Deccan is wonderful thousands of kilometers of this bouldered terrain so I wanted to write about the topography, history, religion of the Deccan, which is a little covered area. So I wrote a book called Divining the Deccan. Divining? Divining. Divining the Deccan. And yeah. you did just that, I no did doubt. a motorbike journey from Shirdi to Puttaparthi, about 750 kilometers. Amazing. Stopping off at all the you know, little places people don't usually visit. And, uh, in that book, I had mentioned uh, staying a few days at Puttaparthi, and uh, someone who read this chapter then suggested, why don't you do a full-length Life of Sai Baba? Because they liked how I presented him. And before you go on, what caused you to stop for a few days in Puttaparthi? Just another... Well, I'd been coming since the 70s. Okay, so you Partly were... Partly because my companion on the inner path is a great devotee of Sai Baba. Ranima, mm -hmm. 
and uh, also the Deccan being till recently a comparatively backward area, it had very interesting steam railway re remnants. So you could report on those age. with your book? Well, uh, I came to India to study comparative religion, but I found comparative railways much more interesting. <laughs> That's sort of a metaphor, isn't it? <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> and Between throw in the rocks and you have the whole universe. Yes. Yeah, um, so you said you came here with your companion back in the 70s uh -huh. because she was a follower of Satya Sai Baba. Did yeah. any of that rub off on you? I mean, that's... The well, obviously, right. I wouldn't have been able to write the book. <laughs> I mean, an awful lot rubbed off. Well, I say that because of your comment to me yesterday that mm. I asked if you were a Baba devotee and you said, no, you're not. Not in that technical sense that, I mean, in India, I mean, it's normal to have a guru and belong to some sect or group and then they more or less uh, insist like the living religions that if you're if you're initiated or born into this cult that's it buddy <laughs> you you stick in fact my my own guru's guru uh, when he he was an english professor way back in 1930 he came to india and his guru said to him i'm only going to give you initiation if you promise to stick Otherwise, we do tend to wander. <laughs> well, a friend of mine this morning, in, in characterizing what he feels uh, your relationship might be with mm -hmm. Sai Baba is, he said, no, I don't think he is a devotee of Sai Baba. I think he's a man who loves Sai Baba. Yeah. And he said, furthermore, mm -hmm. I don't think any of us can decide if we're devotees. Devotees mm -hmm. are somebody Sai Baba decides upon. Yeah. yeah. So, back to the story. You're in Puttaparthi, mm. and you know a little bit about this village now. You know a lot about the, the rock formations, and, you're, <laughs> and your editor is putting two and two together and saying, how about a book on Sai Baba? No, this wasn't the editor. This was a, this was a devotee, oh. <laughs> if you like. I mean, an old uh, a student who'd been to Sai Baba's college and is a member of the, uh, I mean, what you can call the higher echelons of administration in the, in the ashram. And this person liked this chapter, and I, I'm, I'm assuming that she liked this chapter, because then she said, you can do it. And I said, I'm reluctant to do it, because I feel it should be done by a devotee who, I mean, who has the sort of the passion to go into all the, all the biographical details, you know, search the archives. I, I don't know Telugu, and uh, uh, I'm just too, uh, too much of a slob to want to go into all these sort of <laughs> nitty-gritties. I doubt that, but perhaps a non-devotee could bring a greater sense of objectivity. Well, this, was, this is what she wanted. She, when she read that first description, which was quite, I mean, sympathetic, but also detached. Uh, she sort of thought this would appeal to the Indian intelligentsia who have a terrible sort of a prescription against Sai Baba. You and know, and why is that? Uh, it's fashionable to be seen against anything popular. <laughs> that simple? No, it's much more complicated than that. Uh, it's partly because India wants to be seen as modern and rejecting all this Godman stuff that we don't have to be spiritual. Let's be, you know, uh, modern technology, sending space probes to the moon and so on. Now, there are several reasons, but a lot of it is uh, the natural outcome of independence, I mean, pride. So did you reluctantly agree to take on this task? Very, or? very reluctant. And what pushed you over the top? Her persuasiveness? No, Ranima. Ranima. And describe her for those people who aren't, because they had the pleasure to interview her. Well, if ago. you've seen a steamroller, <laughs> Well, she hardly resembles a steamroller. <laughs> no, but I mean in, in her sort of... Uh, uh, yes, in her power of persuasion. Yeah, they say that the Punjabi is the Texan of in India. <laughs> <laughs> and she tends <laughs> to win most of our arguments, not by persuasion, but by just sheer, sheer wearing down. That's, the, a, that's a wonderful the, the, line. So there was no point in opposing her if she said, do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try. And having and, worked with her for many, many years. Well, she is also uh, my guru ban. That she shares my former guru. I used to live in an ashram. 
uh, when I came to India, I joined first the Gandhian ashram because I was interested in the so-called good good life. Mm -hmm. But it turned out to be too too simple for my complicated <laughs> mentality. <laughs> then I moved to an Orthodox Indian ashram, mm -hmm. Hindu ashram, which was a very good sort of broke all the sort of Scottish, you know, limited uh, thinking that I had. And then uh, this lady came along with a steamroller. <laughs> And I fell in love with this lady, and my guru said, right, if you're in love, that is the way to the goal. <laughs> Go join her, be her secretary, and, you know, earn your living like most people, and see, see, see how the other half live and have to pay the taxes instead of running away to all the spirituality, so-called. So maybe it's safe to say behind this wonderful book stand two powerful women who were persuasive in pointing you in the right direction. Precisely. Now, what did you discover about Well, the right yourself? direction, of course, is, 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 is for the reader. And so far, the audience, you see, was this Indian intelligentsia from whom there's been no feedback at all. Because reviews in India anyway are very few and far between. Why is that? There are so many books published. Okay. And uh, the space, as you've seen, I mean, a tiny little column, 500 words, passes off as a, as a review. I mean, we simply don't have space. And... Uh, Editors naturally do a bit of back scratching, they put in their favorites. And it takes several months before the books even come to their notice. So this was published in November. Mm -hmm. So I would imagine now, January, February, if there's going to be any notice, it will happen. Otherwise, there may be no, no reviews at all. But this is different because it's really a book meant for broad distribution for, I would guess, non-devotees mostly. Yeah, as yeah well precisely. As yeah. Devotees. People like me who are sympathetic but uh, curious and they've, got, they've had a lot of negative media mm -hmm. uh, stuff about Sai, Sai Baba. And how did you handle that part of the book? There's a whole chapter devoted to... Uh, you know, facing this head on. Because, as I say, it's fashionable. I mean, scandal sells. Whether there's any truth in it, you know, you have, you have obscene headlines, and the next day, a tiny apology that it was total back of lies. I mean, this is humanity. I mean, we are crazy. At least uh, you and I, Ted, may be slightly less crazy <laughs> because we are aware that we're crazy. So how can anybody or anything good survive the onslaught of such negativity when it comes the way this has come? Well, presumably when God created Homo sapiens, he knew what he was doing, so I leave it to his, you know, greater wisdom. But uh, I don't find people offensive. They may be stupid. I'm stupid, but I don't find I'm offensive. <laughs> Or stupid yeah. people offensive. I mean, we we have a problem. It may be, you know, because of the planets, or whatever. But uh, before we get to the book, uh, a little more about your background. Were you raised with the conventional religious background of Great Britain? Uh, well, Great Britain, of course, is a very <laughs> weird sort of term. I mean, I was born in the Scottish village, very Calvinist. And uh, on, s on Sundays, they used to lock the swings, you know, the, the playground. Because nothing... You don't enjoy. Energy. I mean, you have a theory that says the chief end of man is to enjoy God, but kids can't swing on a Sunday. <laughs> I mean, it was a self-punishment. So I obviously had to, you know, compensate for this shortcoming in my uh, idea of divinity. So I was obviously brought to India and... So that launched your spiritual inquiry with the ashram. Well, as a child, I was always one of these awkward customers asking why. I mean, you got to, you know, clip around the lug, <laughs> shut up, <laughs> eat your bun. <laughs> Which made you ask even louder, why? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and nobody there in your village could come up with an adequate answer. No, but at least my parents, who are very well adjusted, they were laissez-faire. Okay. That's and good. Uh, they let other people clip me on the luck. <laughs> <laughs> if, if he wants to, you know, let him, you know. And, uh, okay. So, so uh, bye bye to Calvinism and Scotland. Hello to India. No, no, I value Calvinism. I mean, good. Uh, well, uh, that's. I mean, I don't burn people at, at the stake. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I mean, there's limits to my Calvinism. <laughs> Sai Baba, I think, would say, if you're born a Calvinist, be a good Calvinist. Well, my guru, who actually, funnily enough, my, my Vaishnav Orthodox Indian guru, was actually 
a Scottish Calvinist. I mean, this is weird. <laughs> this is really weird. Was this coincidence His that you ended up with Sri, someone? Well, Sri Madhavashish, as he, he was called. Uh, he was actually born in Edinburgh. I mean, belonging to the clan Campbell. <laughs> Campbells of Ar Argyle. And uh, funny, isn't it? Yes. And he said, <laughs> sorry, Bill, Born a Calvinist, you're doomed for life. <laughs> it's true in some ways, because, I mean, you can never really enjoy, as Indians enjoy, you know, yeah. simple sins. <laughs> being, being a Calvinist, your well, conscience, is, you know, overriding like a serpent. Born a Catholic might give you a run for your money there yeah. as a Calvinist, too. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you then about once you got into this process, probably it's taken you s uh, several years, perhaps, to write this book? No, no. It's, uh, say, two years from start to finish, of which one year was, I mean, I finished it and I gave it to Penguin in January 2003, and the project was suggested to me in December 2000 and when? 2000. It, it was two years, the actual okay. writing uh, was about three to four months. And are you happy with the book? I'm happy with the book, yeah, because it was for me uh, very onerous in 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 the beginning. Because, as I say, research-wise, I wasn't really inspired. I mean, I had Castori's books, which I find can be sometimes infuriating, in the possible because I had suffered from the same sin, sin of what my editor calls dis disconnectivity. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of us suffer that. Yeah. Uh, what did you learn about yourself in writing this book about Saibaba? Well, not, not, uh, not a lot, but I originally called it uh, A Star Race. That's a nice title too. And uh, I, this month, wrote in high contact with Penguin. I panicked and said, I can't biography. I simply don't have enough stuff. So can I change it to a sort of travelogue, you know, so I can bring in my anecdotes of the over the past 20 years travels, you know, East Time, how it's grown, and and, and they just ignored knowing <laughs> my disconnectivity. <laughs> they just ignored that. And sure enough, this uh, person who had encouraged me to write the the various books published by the Trust, and then these minor graces, what they call the Sai Param sitting cards. Which is a term I've never heard describing well, the that's my invention. triumvirate than, uh, until you wrote about it. Yeah, well, uh, minor graces started to happen. And uh, the creating grace was, after the book was about to be released in October this, this, this year, uh, came down, I live in Missouri, put a party person, came for six weeks in Missouri uh, to give me answers, questions, you know, about Kasturi's voids, gaps, you know, in the authenticity, who did this, who did that. Raniyama, of course, had a lot of background stuff. And over the years, she's collected all these Sanatan Sati's. So I had, you know, the, as it were, the primary sources. But this lady who was up in the administration, she could correct me on, you know, names and dates. And, uh, but I came down, the book was in, in the, as I say, I gave it in January. Apparently, the Birthday of 2002, Sai Baba was given the manuscript and he said, call it a life. This is what I'm told, I, I have no means of knowing. Well, that's probably true. I heard it from so, somebody on that level. Yeah, someone who had presented it to Baba. Baba handled it. I've got that manuscript. And he suggested the title He said, a life. Grace went out of the window, but it came back with a vengeance. Because what happened a year later, uh, as I say, I'm down from the hills where I live in Ranima's house. In October this the last year, I got hepatitis mm. of a very serious, virulent kind and very nearly kicked the bucket. Mm. And, uh, but instead of kicking the bucket, uh, I had this ex extraordinary... We're going to be hearing, as you tell your story, some no, amazing that is, sounds. That is a warning not to s share secrets. <laughs> you think it is? Yeah. All right, well, this isn't a secret you're sharing with us. Tell us what you think this means. Is this an auspicious sign? Read the 
Tibetan Book of the Dead. You're the second person to suggest that. Thine own consciousness shining in the void. And uh, the word, the only key word I can give is luminosity. What they talk about in the after body state of luminosity, that which is written I can confirm, you know, thanks to Baba, because I could easily have, you know, gone that way. But uh, it wasn't in my hands to decide. I was just there, sort of before this sort of luminous proscenium, you know, the void. And here I am, I mean, we should Baba's grace. And, and we should probably tell anyone watching where exactly it is that you are. You are in a flat, listening to Saturday afternoon budgeons at five o'clock, Almost a stone's throw from what's to become in the next few days Satya Sai Baba's new home. Residence from Sankranti, yes, from and, the turning of the sun. And for all we know, we're across the street from his bedroom because yes. we're that close. Yeah. So here we are with Budgeons accompanying your story yeah. about this book. Yeah. We're going to probably have to speak up a little bit for you to hear me, mm. but go on. Mm. What was it? that surprised you the most in writing this book when you researched all the stories about Sai Baba? There was no surprise as such. The surprise was the assistance I was getting in psychic terms because I thought this is beyond me. But I can, uh, there's a phrase in Hindi, apne ap, of its own accord. So this book wrote itself apne ap that I was the, uh, as in the Quran, Allah said, recite. You were the instrument. The amanuensis. I was the reed, Rumi's. <laughs> and have you had that experience before in your writing history? Not in such a focused, no. Because this book, as I say, other books I'd written because it was like having a child wanting to get out. You had to, you know, get it. And what came through that you recall that you knew wasn't from you, but from somewhere else? The book. The whole book. The whole book? Would you pass it to me for a second? Because there's several phrases... I mean, if, uh, if someone said, uh, this isn't your book, I say, fine. You know, I, I wouldn't lay spiritual copyright to this. A couple this of comments. Is... A couple of comments from you mm -hmm. on what you've written. There are so few outer trappings of religion in Puttaparthi. There is no Sai religion, only Sai love. Mm -hmm. What is Sai love? Oh, only this morning I suddenly realized I had a, I, I had omitted in my list of non-religiosity. Uh, features, no collection box, no stained glass windows. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, it's not in here. <laughs> but when you talk I about... I rather like it, that's the one thing I like about... Uh, I like stained glass windows. <laughs> I would like them here. In fact, maybe in a former life I was a stained glass window maker, painter. <laughs> but, uh, but, sorry, the question was? The question was... What is Sai Love? What is Sai Love? Well, I think it's what you guys have for one another. Or, or you have for your calling. But it's you, just a natural, I mean, life. I mean, just, just why, why we're human. I mean, we, we have come here, I mean, to perform some, some purpose. It's not a grim duty as Orthodox religion paints it to be. It is a wonderful uh, discovery. But is the love that you call Psy Love here on a Saturday afternoon in January, significantly different than the love you would find in a Calvinist church in Scotland on a Sunday morning? Now if I went back, I would probably say no. Not that I have any sort of great urge to go back, but I obviously, I mean, I have my, my questions have now been rendered, they haven't been answered, but I'm, I'm not concerned for answers, you know? Be and the reason is because the experience along the path that you've been on has given you enough that you feel sated, that there's no further need to explore? Or is it because of no, something No, I love to discover 
new things you know I would love to go around now on my motorbike discovering more and more rocky outcrops <laughs> and do a gazetteer you know so it's, it's not discovery it's just that those answers that I mean when people used to go to Ramana Maharshi they had a whole list of questions you know burning questions you know deeper soul echoes and then the moment they saw him the questions were forgotten it's like that with Sai Baba I mean, <laughs> a line that intrigues me in your book is like everyone else I have never failed to be uplifted by the mere sight of this stand-in for the divine yeah. there is this baffling stream of energy between him and his disciples that works its magic on the audience Again, it's back to this feeling of love. And also you see the flesh. If I'm in Delhi and I hear people, you know, critical of Sai Baba, you know, uh, out of habit, you make jokes, you know, to be part of their set. The flesh is where, I mean, God didn't make, make the world, you know, as, as something sinful or, or, or misshapen, deformed. I mean, it's wonderful. It's, it's, it's our conditioning that makes it misformed. I mean, you see this man, he's extraordinary. <laughs> Quite, I mean, show me another. I mean, I've been around. I mean, you read about Christ, Muhammad, the Buddha. That's the sort of quality of Mahatma Gandhi, perhaps. But I mean, this man is totally something else. And to the uninitiated, what's their explanation for that? Because most days he doesn't say many words to people. But you see how he galvanizes people. Huh? And India people never run. <laughs> they spend all the time belting around just to glimpse his aura. I mean, this is phenomenal. But it's, I think it's something within you, every soul, you know, either you have this mad, madness for the divine, or you, or you don't. I mean, a lot of people say, first let me be rich, let me be a millionaire, then I'll, you know, then I'll turn to religion. I mean, a lot of people are like that. And when you made your first million dollars, did you decide to turn towards religion? I've got... I find this guy, I mean, how, how much, how many millions you put a guy like this? I mean, that's what I say, not the price, the value. You, know? you see... Oh, the my rocks, I mean, how much are you going to pay for that? Yes. <laughs> so, here's a, it's a dichotomy here, because you talk about the people who come running here, and in fact, they do. Mm -hmm. uh, on any given day, tens of thousands of people. Talking to Mr. Uni, the accommodations director, the other day, there are people here from 172 countries over Christmas time. That's what I like. Yes, it's universal. So it's yeah. universal. Yeah. It's great numbers, yeah. and yet and it's buoyant. It isn't this, you know, usual religious, you know, grim. I mean, these people from all the nations, they're not concerned about, you know, I'm a Scotsman, I'm better than you, I'm a Brahmin, I'm better than you. No, it's Sai Baba's better than us all. <laughs> and there's a great equalizer, isn't yeah. there? In that this everyone, book is, yeah. everyone dresses the same. Yeah. It doesn't make any difference if you can't understand the three people speaking in three foreign languages exactly. next to you. Yeah. You're here for one reason. Yeah, it could be Babel. But in fact, it's quite the opposite. It's a very, very loving sort of understanding experience. It's experience rather than sensation. I'll speak up so that you can hear me over the beautiful budgeons as I recite your own words to you. Such a side, despite my serious reservations about anyone who parades his or her beliefs in holy cloth, has the ability to arouse in me the profoundest love and move my soul so deeply that all mental questioning is still, well, nearly all. I have no idea whether he is God or man or both, but this does not affect his impact on my soul in the slightest. I know what I feel, and that buoyant reality is beyond verbal definition. I feel indescribably graced that I was born to see an aspect of divinity that has not yet been witnessed on earth for thousands of years. End of interview. <laughs> you mean that. You mean that profoundly. You've already said uh, the way you've characterized your ebullient love for this man, even though you don't define yourself as a devotee. There's no, only I have it for other. I have it for my lovely little dog in Delhi, uh, re <laughs> reincarnate Lama, uh, Absoteria. I have it for a woman who I have loved since childhood. But, but Sai Baba is something else. He is divinity. That you, I've never seen anything like it. So for the newcomer reading your book, when you talk about he is not a religion, 
how are they to be convinced of that? You say here religion has... Well, I'm sorry, unless you actually see this guy, you're not going to get the full impact, are you? I, no. I don't know, maybe, I mean, you can get dreams and so on of that intensity, but I feel sad that this book's so late now, he hasn't many years to go, in spite of his prophecy. It's hard to see him, his physical frame, but miracles happen. So it's sad that pe people are going to miss this, I mean, equivalent of Christ or equivalent of Buddha. Well, perhaps it's sad, but there's still ample time for millions more to come. And there to is going to be a third form, they say. Yeah. But I'm quite happy. <laughs> it's more than I can, my soul can accommodate. My guru always said, don't ask for too much spiritual bliss. It'll kill you. <laughs> you die. You know, we... With such a Sai Baba, in your view, what's the larger part of the equation? The significance of the words he uses in his discourses or his silent darshan when he walks among? I think Baba's discourses are as, <laughs> shall we say, uh, uh, uninspiring as uh, Kasturi's writing. But, I mean, there's a lesson, obviously, is my problem. But obviously, it's his, it's his being which I feel is my being, if I could only, you know, uh, stabilize it. And when you compare the beings of wonderfully inspired holy men alive today, for example, I'm thinking of, I did a story uh, when the Dalai Lama visited my hometown in Ohio, and I interviewed a small child. Baba's coming. Oh, Baba's coming. Yeah. I interviewed a small yeah. well, we should We should probably try to document this as much as we can, if we can see, and there he is. Well, this is an auspicious day for us, too. <laughs> I forget what I was saying. It doesn't make any difference, does it? Well, that's a divine, isn't it? The questions don't matter. <laughs> <laughs> so, you're very childlike in your enthusiasm and feelings for this man in the orange robe. So I like in the New Testament sense, has become, become as a child, yes. Yes. But it isn't a child, of course, it's actual wisdom because the mind hasn't interfered, hasn't, hasn't distorted its mirror. So the question now that I recall that I was about to ask was, you didn't use the word magnet, but you sort of implied that Baba's magnetic. And I think of uh, the Dalai Lama, when I interviewed a seven-year-old boy, about the Dalai Lama, he said, well, he's always smiling and always laughing and I call him the Jolly Lama. Yeah. There are spiritual figures that just exude this love of life and love of soul, yeah. and certainly Sai Baba is one of them. Yeah. Is there something more that intrigues you than just the outer form? It's not the outer form that intrigues, is it? you're really getting an echo, you're getting a reflection of one's own being. And uh, now my advantage as a, uh, not a technical devotee is, everyone who lives here are going to be totally, I mean, uh, destroyed when Baba leaves his body. I'm not. I'm not, you know. And, and why won't you be affected this way? I'd be, I'd be affected because Rani Mahay knows it's, we have the Indian custom of Sati, going with the beloved, you go, I know. The but last... I, you know, I already feel this man is much more than his body, you know. This man is the real me, or the real everyone, every man. So who is Sai Baba? Why ask me? You have to ask the inner, the inner witness. You say here, Rani Ma, who understands the limitations of words and has no need for the crutch of logic, seems to have got it right when she keeps reminding me, I don't believe Sai Baba is God. He's something much more. Absolutely, yeah. Again, technically God is one of these uh, profound yet uh, in, indefinable terms. God, I mean, it's a term of convenience. I mean, English is a dreadful language. I mean, it's got no inner content. The vocabulary is square, you know, it's got no oomph, no, no, no spiritual eros, you know, it's religion is, as, as Saxon is, uh, 
Sasquatch are dreadful, you know. <laughs> if you want enlightenment, <laughs> go to the Western Isles or <laughs> Ireland. <laughs> well, despite your um, your feelings about the limitations of the English language, for those who don't have the privilege of coming here and seeing Sai Baba in person, well, uh, it's wonderfully pragmatic for communication. English is the best. You know? Do you think one day, though? your use of English language with your book and others will magnetically draw more people across How the oceans? I know? I mean, uh, one, uh, I mean, any author, you know, a book is his child, so he obviously hopes that it's not going to be sort of chucked aside. I mean, for me, the greatest thrill is the first book I wrote, published in 1992, is still in print. I mean, it's what, it's what they call a steady mover, <laughs> you know, which is better than a bestseller. A bestseller, you see, for one year, it whams the charts, and maybe two years. And flames out. And then, you know, <laughs> Jeffrey and Lord Archer should have consigned you know, forever. So to, to move steadily, the tortoise, you know, is, is probably a better thing for, for an author. Well, I'm intrigued because your book is really among very few that purport to be uh, as objective as yours has shown itself to be. And I would think with that in mind, you may be prevailed upon to one day write more about this holy man. Would you, you consider the, that? No, no, no. The vehicle's too, too ancient now. Uh, and uh, the funny thing is, this book is, you know what it's classified as, officially, for your Congress catalog? Uh -huh. Autobiography. <laughs> so, because obviously it's, it's my interpretation. It's, it, there's only two chapters, like what you can call chron chronological life. It's more my, you know, casting. So it's as though, you know, Sai Baba has had a joke that this, this chap, you see, couldn't write a biography about me. So he ends up writing his own. <laughs> I mean, weird, really weird. <laughs> but volume two, you know, sequel, I, I can't see unless, of course, the steamroller comes, <laughs> <laughs> comes into operation. But I So perhaps see. with the help of the steamroller and that cosmic experience called somebody else writing for you, because you feel certain that that happened with this book, but not I your others. I couldn't write a book like this. I simply don't know enough. You know, where does, if there's any wisdom in it, I mean, where does it come from? I mean, I'm hardly, you know, a wise person. I mean, I do the most stupid things. You ask the steamroller. <laughs> so, his grace. Where is it going to lead you personally? You're still a relatively young man. You've withstood many physical assaults with the diseases of your past. Yeah, and I mean, this sort of... Uh, uh, dialogue with death is not the first time. I mean, I the first book I wrote was uh, I had typhoid, fasted for 40 days, and that experience was uh, of the great engine of the universe. Uh, so I've been really lucky, and you know, uh, India has really given me a double whammy, you know, nearly killed me twice. Well, let's <laughs> talk body. about these three experiences called typhoid, hepatitis, and Sai Baba. <laughs> How much of all three of them collectively done to reduce or eliminate fear? And this is only Sai Baba. Only Sai Baba. Uh, yeah. Are you well, through, through his hepatitis. Because prior to that, like everyone, you know, death, especially the older you get, you really become, you know, scared. scared. And what's Talk next? But now, I think it's just... I was reading a Harry Potter book the other day, <laughs> and... Uh, she was, somebody was talking about death is the next ad adventure. You don't Prin share that? Principal Dumbledore. No, it is. It's, it is an adventure. It's a travel by motorbike. <laughs> you know, the wind in one's hair, another grace. So what's going to happen once you, once any of us cross that threshold? Search me, Lord. <laughs> One last question, and I'm going to repeat it because I've already asked you once before. For the totally uninitiated who stumble into a musty library and one day pull out a videotape that talks about the story written by Bill Aiken called Sri Satya Sai Baba, A Life. And they ask you after reading the book, tell me, please, Bill, who is Sai Baba? What would you say? 
thine own consciousness shining in the void. Thank you very much in Sairam. <laughs> Respecting and abiding by 